Good morning, good evening, and good day. You're listening to Drama Buds, an anima podcast. So hello everyone, welcome back, welcome to season 4 of Drama Buds. It has been literally months since I recorded an episode, so allow me a long intro. I feel like it's fun to talk about why I was gone for a few months. And that's because uh, two of those months, I was an ensemble cast member for Miss Saigon. So that's funny. <laughs> that's funny because life is uh, very strange when you just let it take you wherever it wants to take you. But okay, okay. Two K-drama related realizations. First of all, when you're in a slump, which I knew I was going to be in a slump after my liberation notes. When you're in a slump, the best way out of it is truly just to not force it. Because, I mean, not by choice. I, I literally, I had no time and no energy to, you know, watch K-dramas as religiously as I did when I was in rehearsals every day. So, at some point, I could only keep up with... I was finishing Extraordinary Attorney Wu. I started If You Wish Upon Me. And that's all I could really like commit to for, for those months when it coincided with the airing dates. I tried watching like, oh, a completed drama. I'll just watch episodes whenever I can. But it just did not work. It was very, very difficult. I barely got through what, five episodes of a K-drama because I just I had no time or energy. But by the time the, the whole trip was ending, because I was in another country, I was so excited to go home and watch K-dramas. Like, I made it out of my slump. To me, a slump is when I just have no... I find no joy in watching. And so it just, it really feels like a drag because I have to, you know, force myself to get through things. It's not because I literally cannot finish. Like, I can put it on the background and not pay attention to it and say it was a terrible show. But uh, I got out of the slump. I was excited to watch things. So, yeah, guys, just don't force it. But now I'm doing great. I'm enjoying what I'm watching. We will talk about all of that. And second K-drama related realization. So you know how in my liberation notes, the geographical distance of San Po to Seoul is kind of like a metaphor for, you know, social isolation and ostracization and not belonging and stuff. Like apparently it's not a metaphor. Apparently, if you live far and have that kind of personality, it does get incredibly lonely. <laughs> you think it's scary when a K-drama, you know, almost exactly describes or depicts what happened in your past? I'm telling you, it's scarier when a K-drama predicts your future. That's, it's significantly worse. So those are my K-drama related realizations for the past two months. And now let's just get to, you know, how many K-dramas did you finally end up watching because I, I got home in like the first week of September how many K-dramas did I end up watching in three weeks four <laughs> I only finished four K-dramas in the past three months um, of all the shows that were released this year in 2022 I finished 13 all the dramas I've watched this year 22 dramas and overall my lifetime record is 109 K-dramas so let's just start with the recap <laughs> So let's start with the completed drama that I tried to start and it took me forever to finish this. Uh, I watched My Unfamiliar Family. Okay, you know, I thought I would love this more because I mean, it's a K-drama about a family with three siblings. Like, come on, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know me. If you know anything about me, you know that gets to me very easily. And at first, I was kind of impressed. Like, I used to think, oh, I genuinely want to know what happens next at the end of every episode. And then, like, over time, I realized they were doing a clickbaity uh, type of ending. They always end with a cliffhanger. And then they spent 15 minutes of the next episode going through the events that led to that specific dramatic scene. And then, you know, the conclusion of the scene is that it's actually, it's probably not as dramatic as you think it is. I mean, to say it's manipulative is, you know, that's the point of television. I don't know. It just felt like they could have shaved off, you know, many minutes of the runtime by telling a more linear story and making the endings more organic instead of just 
you know, putting those cliffhanger endings. I don't know. It it just leaned a little too dramatic and not organic. Essentially, it just it just felt very unnatural. I didn't like it. The characters are really well fleshed out, though. It's a well written show. I can say that it's well written. This is a best screenplay nominee. You know that that has some value. However, for me, the events were a little too macho. Just listing down, you know, the most prominent tropes. We have amnesia, we have adoption, we have cheating, we have a second family, we have all sorts of miscommunications. Like every possible thing that two people could miscommunicate about, they've miscommunicated. <laughs> so there were too many Makjang events for me to develop like an emotional attachment. Because I kept thinking, you know, okay, at around episode six, okay, uh, I'm just gonna hold on. I'll hold on. Like at some point, you know, they will run out of things to reveal and then we can get to, you know, the real family emotions. Um, But hey, by the time that they got to, yeah, the, the real family part I couldn't develop an emotional connection the entire show is just miscommunication as a trope taken to like 80 like a solid 80 it's not full makjang you know but it's, it's close to it and 30% of the show is flashbacks <laughs> so if you're a person who's bothered by that like oh dude a, a huge chunk of the show is in flashbacks characters wise like my feelings about the characters I feel bad for Unju as a character because she is like the trope punching bag like every possible terrible thing that could be given to her a character was given to her. Oh, sorry to spoil it. She's adopted. She's in a kind of marriage of convenience that was kind of loveless or the, the unrequited love at some point. And then, you know, they they couldn't conceive. She had a miscarriage. And then she, uh, her husband was, uh, was he cheating on her? He was cheating on her, right? Because he was also hiding that he's gay. And then just a lot of things. Just so many things. And then everyone just, you know, goes off on her because she doesn't have like a pleasant personality like her younger sister sister I don't know man Unju I just felt bad for her like the narrative hated her this is what it looks like when like, I think the writer has a personal vendetta against this character or something because it is truly too much every possible negative thing they gave to her so yeah felt bad for her what else I, I cannot believe this show got me to not root for Shin Dong Woo because this is his okay this is his second cutest role his cutest role for me is still Choi Myung Ho in live but you know vice president he's very cute terrible person-ish but so cute and that's Shin Dong Woo and I did not root for him because Kim Ji Sook is here friends the lovers wins Friends, the lovers will always win. I'm sorry, Shin Dohok. And Kim Ji Sok, I just have a very, I have a soft spot for him for some reason. But yeah, that's, those are my only thoughts. Han Yeri was great. I, I enjoyed her performance a lot. Yeah, that's it. Overall, I mean, it's a good show. It's a good show. It's well written. Uh, I would recommend it to people. It, it's a good family drama. Some people will enjoy the Makjang events. They will enjoy the ropes. And that's, that's really okay. I just didn't develop the attachment that I expected to, uh, you know, experience with a family drama knowing me, knowing my tastes and everything. So next show that I finished, it was technically released this year, but I binged it in like a day. Uh, Alice the Final Weapon or Ultimate Weapon Alice. This is just a weird little show. I had no expectations going into it. It was only like 30 minutes each. And there were eight episodes, so barely any time. It's a mix of like dark comedy, thriller, high school romance. This is by Lee Byung Hun PD. So Be Melodramatic, 20, the movie, Extreme Job, the movie. His sense of humor is really <laughs> It's really my type of humor. So that's why I enjoyed that aspect. I like the comedy. I like the high school romance. I, I really don't care about the thriller. But unfortunately, like towards the end, it had to focus on that because that's the you know the plot part. I don't see this show was bad because I never thought it could be that good. It's just a fun, freaky little show that was not very fun anyway. Uh, you, you can skip it. Uh, I'll declare this as a skip. Everything about you oh, Everything about you So moving on to the dramas that I watched while they were ongoing. First, we have Yumi Cells 2, which is the season 2 of my second favorite K-drama from 2021. And fortunately, I liked season 2 a lot less than the first season. But I still liked the ending overall. Because I think it kind of stuck to the message and it stuck to the original material. Where it wasn't really about getting any of the guys, but about how Yumi grows through her relationships. 
until the last one, which we will not see yet, maybe. So I know I'm going to see comments that the writing's bad because, you know, they didn't even give us a chance to understand Bobby. But that's like, if you think the point of the show is to understand him and not to understand how Yumi feels about him. I don't know. I, I'm, I guess it's because I'm very solid, like, team Yumi. Or I, I'm not invested in the boys themselves. How Yumi will grow through it. And like, I know, or deep in my heart, I'm still hoping that they'll stick to the Sunrock ending. So I, I thought the writing was good because they made me either root for them or at least understand if Yumi chose either of the guys or none of them. And I mean, for for a show like this, for some people consider it as a rom-com, yeah, it's rare for me to be completely unsure of where a story is headed. Because at that point, season 3 is not confirmed, so we didn't know if they were going to introduce Sunrock or are they really going to change the event from the webtoon so that it's really Babi Endgame or maybe Wong Endgame because like, they kept adding him into season 2. Yeah, like, I genuinely didn't know where the story was headed. Most of the people complaining are those who rooted for Bobby. Really, I'm serious. But once again, the endgame is not the point. This is not a traditional rom-com, even if it shares many of the same beats. I like how when Yumi and Bobby got back together, they highlighted how Love Cell wasn't in Yumi's village. At that point, she didn't really love him anymore. Knowing that Yumi's prime cell at some point was love. We know that love is important to her. In in a way, yes, it really always will be. So that's something that Yumi should have in a marriage. But it, when they got back together, she was just being carried away by her emotions, by her emotion cell. I hated how they dragged Wung back into this to add some kind of like love triangle tension because they made him so pathetic, right? And I felt like all these extended scenes with Wung cells were unnecessary because that kind of highlighted how, okay, so Wung, who's not really our main guy for season two, gets a bunch of, you know, screen time with his cells. But Bobby, we still don't fully understand him. He still doesn't get like cell exposure, <laughs> right? So that highlighted a problem with the writing. So I wish we had less of Wung, yeah. I loved how she ended on good terms with both guys. I mean, knowing Yumi, she could have easily dragged this out and hated them forever and victimized herself all the time. But, you know, this is a sign that she matured as a person because she could end well with both of the guys in her life. I just really love how they told the story. It's, it's such an interesting way to deliver a story and explain a character's personality and decisions. So conceptually, this is still one of my favorite K-dramas. I, I, you know, it's inside out, but for dating. <laughs> Once again, I liked season one a lot more. But I'm hopeful for season 3 or they said even a movie is possible. I hope they're able to do that because uh, Yumi Cells was a big success on TV and they didn't cast anyone as Sunrock officially. So, you know, lots of chances for my personal bet, Jung Hae-in. Of course, we need, we need a Kim Go and Jung Hae-in reunion. We need it. The people need it. A movie was not enough. Let's give them a 14-episode drama. Please, I'm begging. But yeah, I mean, Yumi Cells too. Uh, I liked it a lot less, but still, I'm grateful that they stayed true to the webtoon as much as they could. Okay, moving on to the K-drama that was the talk of the town. I mean, everyone and their mothers. Really, literally, everyone and their mothers watch this. <laughs> so yes, I'm talking about Extraordinary Tony Wu. Okay, disclaimer, I guess. Let's get it out of the way. I'm not the authority on good or bad representation. My personal belief is that there is no such thing as perfect representation. The show did a lot of good, right? Like It's good that they featured more than one character with autism. Like That's pretty rare because usually the protagonist is really special and perfect and then we never see the other side or the other aspects of the spectrum, other people on the spectrum. So I, I personally, I really like that. But ultimately, this show is not really meant to educate. It's still meant to entertain. It still falls for the some of the usual pitfalls <laughs> of media that features autistic characters where, of course, our protagonist had to be a genius. She's well-dressed. She takes care of herself well. And she, you know, is a bit more well-adjusted than others on the spectrum. And she is more cognizant of 
social rules and everything, she's still more palatable to a non-autistic audience. So, yeah, I don't think the show was perfect representation, but nothing ever will be. And the show itself now, okay, my struggle with the show, although I did enjoy, like, the first six to eight episodes, I really did, like, I thought it was really great. But I think the show really started faltering in the second half. Now, to describe it, usually, when I describe a show, it's like, okay, is it more plot-driven or is it more character-driven? For Attorney Wu, I mean, between plot and character, it is more plot. But there is not much of a plot either. Initially, I loved the episodic pacing, right? But then it started dragging after the case with the tree, which I think was episode 8. Because the cases were not that deep or dark, which fits the tone of the show, so that's okay. But in a typical 16-episode K-drama, it's actually, it's not sustainable. For most of the episodes, it was just episodic cases with some character moments and just 10 or so minutes of character development all in all for everyone. It's very Western. It's a very Western procedural show format, right? So the plot isn't much because the cases aren't that deep. There wasn't really this big arc that they really spent a lot of time on consistently. But I also cannot say that the show is character-driven because I think the characters were very flat. Like, it's okay that the show focused mostly on Uyong Wu's development, but they never really pushed through with much except for their romance growth. But even that wasn't very well done for me because they broke up and got together without really communicating or fixing anything. Like, that's how forced the breakup was. That's how cliche and frustrating it was. I thought she was going to have this arc of like oh being independent from her father but then suddenly she ended up living with him again without us knowing how or why that happened so did they delete that scene did they delete that whole uh, journey doesn't that seem like the kind of scene you should keep over Suyon's pointless dating arc with trash man or you know her ending up with Kwon Minu? What else? Uh, must we talk about how Lee Jun Ho is a really flat character? I mean, I excused it for the longest time because the show was really refreshing, and then you know we have a female lead with autism, so that that in itself is pretty groundbreaking. Why can't she get a dreamboat rom com male lead like every other female lead, right? So for a while, I was like, it's fine that he's a flat character. Let him be perfect. Let her get the guy. It's fine. But then the show decided to make episodes 13 and 14 and, you know, make it, you know, a drama, a typical drama with typical miscommunication breakup and everything. So you know what? If you're gonna bring typical K-drama stuff to this, I will bring my typical K-drama criticisms. So no more excuses. If they stayed on the light and wholesome path for the entire show, then I really wouldn't have had a problem with it. But then they went through all of that so now I have to point out and then I remember Kang Tae-ho had this uh, magazine interview where he talked about the backstory that I don't know if he came up with it or the writer came up with it but you know Lee Jun ho had a backstory that he failed the bar or something or failed during law school so Instead of feeling bad about himself, he's okay. He just became a litigator, but he has no like self-esteem issues about it. Stuff like that. Like, stuff about his character that didn't come out at all in the show. I really couldn't have told like, oh, yeah, I see that he definitely was, you know, a law student or tried to be a lawyer in the past. I can't say that. He could really have just shown up randomly. And like, yeah, that's his story. It, it didn't show up in the writing or in his character. That's how flat and empty Lee Jun Ho's character was. So... <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I just... At first, it was refreshing until they decided to do that. So now, they deal with the consequences of putting cliche K-drama tropes. Must we talk about episodes 13 and 14? Like, some of the characterization and the plot, especially in these episodes, it just became bizarre, right? Of course, terminal illness. Jong Myung Sok's characterization only works, right? And everything that happens to him only works because I'm so endeared by Kang Ki Yong's performance. But if I did not love his performance, I would have just rolled my eyes. I mean, I did roll my eyes. I, I would not have tolerated this for much longer. Uh, and then, of course, must we talk about Kwon Min Woo's sudden redemption arc and then his sudden love line with Choi Soo which, I mean, you could have seen it coming, yeah, but the show didn't spend any time trying to redeem him, really, to make him likable. The root for this because like you know Suyon kind of had a rough start but then eventually they showed that Tony Wu really 
appreciates her. She's spring sunshine, right? So, you know, if her, the protagonist likes her, we like her too. But Kwon Min Woo has been consistently terrible to Yong Woo. So I feel like our protagonist being our eyes into this world, her opinion and his treatment of her matters. And they just spent no time, I don't know, preparing us, prepping his character for that redemption arc, for that love line. And then Min Woo gets a backstory that we're supposed to pity him for. But not Lee Juno. I just, it's just bizarre. It's just bizarre. I honestly started skipping scenes in episode 3. Mostly the comic relief parts of Gurami and Harry. And then the Min Wusu yun. I skipped, I skipped those scenes. I, I really couldn't care. Uh, and then they announced season 2. Or the possibility of season 2 on the day of episode 15. So I was really prepared for an unsatisfying ending. Um... I mentioned that I thought the episodic pacing was unsustainable and it's not suitable for a 16-episode gay drama. But then the season 2 announcement, kind of like, all's well that ends well, right? I mean, a Western show, a procedural like that, they get a season 2 and then the story continues. Even though there's not much story, there's not much character development. All's well that ends well, right? Because yay, it got a season 2. I guess the format will work if it's seasonal, but who knows if we'll do it. Um, I mean, I heard Park Hong Bin is kind of hesitating. I, I, I don't know. I might be fake news. But yeah, I, I, I'm not very keen on it. I don't think I'll be tuned in. I still, hey, 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 I don't like ending negatively. I still appreciate Park Won Bin's performance. The initial handling of the romance, I still appreciated that. The initial pacing of the show, I liked how it didn't drag plot lines around for episodes, right? So, you know, the episodic stuff, it really did work for the first half of the show. But in general, though, I really couldn't develop the same attachment to the characters and the romance as others did. But, I mean, it's an okay show. I thought it would be a great show, but uh, that changed after... Honestly, episode starting episode 9, it kind of just dragged. I used to think it would be the top contender for best drama, best screenplay, but I don't think so anymore. Like, not top contender. It, it It's definitely still going to get nominated. I don't know. I could be wrong in a year. <laughs> you never know. But uh, yeah, after episode 10, the quality really declined. So, Park Win Bin still, for me, of course, frontrunner for best actress. So, we'll see. But honestly, if season 2 happens, I will not be tuning in. <laughs> Okay, so to quickly go through all the dramas I dropped. First, I dropped Insider after seven episodes. Kang Hanul, I love you, but this just isn't for me. I, I mean, from the very beginning, me knew it wasn't for me. I just realized how much I didn't care about the plot and the characters weren't that interesting and it wasn't a very satisfying ending, I heard anyway. So uh, some people enjoyed it. A lot of people did not end up watching it. It is what it is. Next show I dropped was Our Beloved Summer. So I was trying to watch this on and off during the during the trip. I got through four episodes and I just I couldn't figure out if I should be watching it as a rom-com or as a melodrama. And you know, I don't think the show had it figured out either. Usually you can tell what the show is trying to give you, right? You couldn't tell that a show is trying to be really slick and cool or wacky, funny, or really deep, melancholic. You can figure out what the show is going for but sometimes a show is going for two different things and it's not doing either of it well if our beloved summer was supposed to be a rom-com then it is way too diluted and slow for it but if it's trying to be a melodrama then it's just not it's not deep enough it's not uh dark or sad or emotional enough for it so it was just trying to be two things and then people will say, oh, it's slice of life. <laughs> because people like to throw the label of slice of life on those kinds of shows when they can't tell what it's supposed to be. Because yeah, that's true. That is what life is supposed to be. But I uh, don't know. If, if it's slice of life, then it does not hold a candle to all the wonderful SOL shows I've watched. So yeah, if it's trying to be that, it's not doing that well either. I know a lot of people enjoyed it. A lot of people really love the chemistry. I'm sure they're great actors personally. I did not see any chemistry, but that was just four episodes. So they were still not back together. And what we've seen of their relationship was not much. They were still young and immature. So I am I may have gotten into it because it's access to lovers. So I maybe I could have, but I really... No, it, it just... It's okay. Uh, next drama I dropped was today's webtoon. I got to episode 3. 
This is the same director as I Hear Your Voice, Pinocchio, and 30 But 17. And his directing style and music choice are still stuck in 2015. It still feels like a 2015 drama. Um, so yeah, I just I don't like the director all that much. Sejong doesn't glow here as much as she did in Business Proposal. Even if like On Maom is a very you know bright and cheery character, which is not my type of protagonist. I don't really like bright and cheery protagonists. This show feels like a brighter and more positive missing, right? With the you know the nice lines and the daily struggles and the office politics. But I liked missing because it was sad. So this it it wouldn't have worked. And last show I dropped recently was because this is my first life. I made it through four episodes. I've heard a lot of great things about this, and people who like the shows I like it would recommend this. So I thought, okay, maybe this is for me because I I am into these kinds of shows. But then I realized I have seen these exact same stories and dynamics and setups in Fight for My Way, Be Melodramatic, Love Struck in the City, like three girls with one guy for each of them, and Kim Min Sook's character. His has kind of a similar story to his character in Love Struck in the City and about his girlfriend you know her only dream is to be a wife or to be a mother like I've seen that in Fight for My Way the most interesting part is that Jong So Min's character wants to be a drama writer but I've also seen that in Be Melodramatic and I like that a lot in Be Melo I know that this came first but I've seen the future iterations of those tropes and dynamics and I already liked them or appreciated them enough so I think this didn't really add anything new the only unique unique thing about it is the cohabitation but that involves me liking the male lead or the romance and I just I could not I would keep watching this for Jong So Min but I could not watch that male lead I cannot watch him that's why I've never watched any of his dramas because his characters were like that and I hate watching those characters. And I wasn't rooting for them romantically. Like, if they stayed friends the entire time, cool, no problem. But I have to, like, buy into the fact that they're gonna fall in love. I don't wanna. I don't wanna watch it. So yeah, I just, I've seen it in other dramas that came after. So kudos to, you know, the ones that came before, the ones that paved the way. But yeah, I it's a skip for me. Sorry. I will go through my currently watching list. First, you have If You Wish Upon Me. Okay, a full review of the show is coming. So, you know. You know I loved it. I loved it from the very beginning. Is it perfect? No. Is it even mostly logical? No. But I don't care. Because I like it. And I'm very emotional about it. So that's, save that for the review, okay? D don't worry, don't worry. Next show that I know no one has heard of, I know no one is watching, Unicorn. Starring Shin ha Won Wonjina. Oh my god, guys. It's a sitcom. 40 minutes per episode. And there's like an ABC plotline. Oh my god. So if you didn't know anything about me, before K-dramas, I honestly did not watch a lot of TV. I did not watch a lot of movies. I didn't really do much but study. So, you know, if I had to choose though, like a genre of TV that I liked, sitcoms, definitely. Western comedy. I think that's why I'm very keen on liking the characters because in a good sitcom, if you like the characters, you can stick with them for 7 to 10 seasons and you won't even feel it because that's how much you like the characters. So, sorry tangent, Unicorn is a sitcom and I love it. It's so ridiculous. It's so funny. It is exactly my sense of humor. And of course, Lee Byung-hun PD, as I mentioned earlier, director of Be Melodramatic, of Extreme Job of 20, of course, he has something to do with it. He's credited as the creative director so I assume like he helped a lot with conceptualizing and writing but left the actual directing to someone else. It's really my sense of humor. Shin ha is doing a fun role and I'm so happy. You know, I think actors of his caliber should definitely be doing more roles like these because if you're always stuck doing, you know, the dark, gritty, emotional, award-winning roles, like, God, that's exhausting. Why can't you be a Michael Scott type? And he is, except he he's ridiculous and he's cringy, but he's not completely like Michael Scott cringe. It's that kind of protagonist. And somehow they are adding some heart some plot to the show we're in episode 8 as of this moment yes this is great and if you find a way to watch it I, I beg you to try I mean if you like the humor of be melodramatic 
It's the same. It's the same. Another unknown show that I'm watching is Salon de Nabi or Fly High Butterfly. It was supposed to air on JTBC but it got shelved because of an actor scandal, I think. Bullying. And and I'm just happy that it ended up on Prime Video somehow. Somehow it's there. I don't have much to say about this. I only watched like an episode and a half so far. It has the same writer as Diary of a Prosecutor and Age of Youth. So I kind of know what to expect. Like when I watched Diary of a Prosecutor, I wasn't very invested. Like it was it was honestly pretty boring. Uh, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. I have the time. I have lots of time. I can watch. Uh, what else am I watching? Mental Coach Jegal and One Dollar Lawyer. We will have a first impressions episode for each of them or for the two of them together. But just so you know, Mental Coach Jagal, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Oh, <laughs> and One Dollar Lawyer, as of now, only one episode has come out. So we'll see. I'll get back to you on that. And you may be wondering, girl, where's the little women? You, me, everyone's watching this show, supposedly. I honestly, I put it on hold. I put it on hold because, guys. I don't think I like thrillers. I don't think I like mysteries. I don't think I like murder. <laughs> I think I'm not interested in murder. Uh, I just, I don't have the patience or the attention span for them. And I'm not invested really in the characters enough to like watch it weekly and just stay confused. Like You come into the episode confused, you come out of it still confused. And I'm just not developing the attachment to like stay hooked the entire time. So, so that I have nothing bad to say about the show, I will just put it on hold and then binge the episodes right before the finale so that I can catch up. And like the story is, you know, moving forward and piecing itself together more cohesively, more conclusively by then. It's just not my genre. I'll admit that now. But okay, here is my opinion on one thing though. I do not hate Inye or I do not find her annoying. Like some people are saying, just, just be grateful. You're such an ungrateful brat. But honestly, it's hard to just be grateful for her sisters when she sees them suffering out of their love and care for her. And, you know, her allying with the rich family, the Park, Park family. Like it's, it's her way of supporting herself to free her siblings of their suffering out of their love for her. Get it? I mean, the family is obviously sketchy. Yes, she knows that. But all her sisters, the three of them, they're all capable of doing risky or dangerous things to survive. In terms of character motivations, you know, Inju obviously does everything for her sisters, for them to live comfortably. Like, her dream is for them to live in a nice apartment. <laughs> uh, right? I I'm pretty sure. And In Kyung is like the righteous one, you know, the truth must come out. These are bad people. We must expose them. Okay, and... You know, Inye, in comparison to those two, it seems like she's so selfish. She's only doing this for herself so she can, you know, pursue studying art and become an artist. And you need connections to survive in that world. But, like, I see her method of achieving her goal, her personal goal, as a way of protecting her sisters as well or preventing their further suffering. So I don't think she's entirely as selfish as some people think. Yes, she's harsh. Yes, she seems bratty. Yes, it always seems like she's against her sister's plans. But she's an internally consistent character to what I perceive to be her goal or her issue with just simply following her sister's orders and their plans. That's all I will say for now about Little Women. Let me just put it out there that Inye doesn't deserve all the hate that she's getting. So this is my favorite section where I talk about other media that's not K-drama. To prove to you that I don't only watch K-dramas, okay? I, I try to do other things. Today, I just finished reading Pachinko. And um, the emotional devastation a little bit. And partially, it also made me appreciate the, uh, the TV adaptation more because I do like the changes. They fleshed out the Solomon and, and the whole modern day, quote-unquote, part of the story more. And just the parallel storytelling hits harder. It, it hits harder in a way because every little detail from the past and all the callbacks to the present, it's more fresh. I, I don't know how to explain it. But good book. Good adaptation. Uh, I'm excited for season 2. Movies I've watched. Everything, everywhere, all at once. I watched that in cinemas. Great experience. Yeah, that's a message that hit home at the time. 
I also watched the before trilogy. Obviously, when I was going through my post MLN like reflection and processing phase, I had to watch media that was similar to it. So yeah, the dialogue was great. I like the first two movies more. Obviously, that's a common opinion, I think. Because I think the dialogues are more intimate. When it's those kinds of lengthy monologues, actually, it it just makes more sense when it's, you know, two people. But when it became like a round table discussion of philosophy in like the third movie or even in the second movie that happened, it didn't feel natural to me. And also today, I watched the Nothing Serious, the rom-com of Jon jong so and Son Soku. It's finally properly subbed on Prime Video. I don't know how long it's been there, but it the subs are finally comprehensible. <laughs> I mean, guys, it's. I don't know why some people don't like it. Like, what did you expect? Okay, I think it's because it won Best Screenplay in the Big Sang Awards last year. That's why people thought, like, oh, it must be really good. But it's just, it's witty. It's very witty. It's not as formulaic as I'd expected. It's a pretty interesting depiction of modern dating. But it's not groundbreaking or anything. It's just that, like, Jun Jung So and Sun Suku are hot. They're good actors. They have good chemistry and they're hot. Like, what more do you need? What more do people need? Yeah, I liked it because I didn't expect much. And for Western TV shows, I I benched Only Murders in the Building Season 2. The first half is pretty slow. I, I watched that really slowly. I wasn't compelled to binge it. But then, I think starting from the end of like episode 6, and then episode 7 was so good! Episode 7 was so good. I think Theo episodes are very good. He's a very interesting character. Yeah, I binged it from 6 onwards. Ended well. I'm excited for season 3. I still am excited for season 3. And currently, Abbott Elementary just started. So I'm also watching that. It feels like a very classic sitcom. And we haven't had those in a while. I'm watching it as it's ongoing. Because I binged the first season. So I'm trying to watch it while it's ongoing. To, you know, mimic the experience of like, what was it like to watch TV back then? (laughs) So yes, I watch and read and do other things aside from just consuming k dramas all day every day guys just so you know So yes, that's it for me today. Before we end, I will declare my top 10 so far of all the K-dramas I've watched. 10th, we have 25, 21. 9th, currently Unicorn. 8th, currently Mental Coach Jegal. 7th, On the Verge of Insanity. 6th, Yumi Sells 2. 5th, My Country, The New Age. 4th, Business Proposal. 3rd, currently If You Wish Upon Me. Second, Pachinko. And number one, to absolutely no one's surprise, my Liberation Notes. Guys, it's been, what, three months? Almost four months since the show ended? Your girl has not moved on. It's just, it's not budging. So I'm just gonna accept it. I, nothing needs to like surpass this. It's, it's okay. It's a standard that does not need to be met by anyone. So that's why I think I'm enjoying a lot of things because I don't, expect them to reach my liberation notes anymore it's just it's already a class of its own in in my heart so yeah that's it for me today uh thank you so much for joining me on today's episode it's been a while and i'm just very happy to talk about k-dramas again and watch a lot of them and yeah like most of the shows or most of the shows on my top 10 as you notice are ongoing shows because i really i think i've ran out of k-dramas and the you know existing catalog that i like so i'm not gonna force it it's hard to look for shows that i like so i'm just gonna watch what's ongoing and then we'll see what i end up liking but yeah thank you so much for joining me thank you so much for listening and i will see you soon thanks for tuning in feel free to leave a comment like subscribe follow and tell me what you thought about today's episode see you soon